today going to take a look at Queen Esther, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's an amazing story. It is an epic story of the Bible. It is a story that inspires. It is a story that has everything. It has, it has um, violence. It has people conspiring. It has trickery. It has lust. It has everything in it. It's great summer reading, by the way. It's great summer reading. It's a wonderful, it's, in fact, the whole Bible is a great summer read. It really is. I like Esther so much that we named our first daughter Esther Joy uh, after Queen Esther. Uh, it is an inspiring story. I'm going to take a moment this morning, and I am going to kind of review the story, and then we're going to focus in on a couple verses. King Xerxes, if you've seen the movie 300 or the, um, the second movie focused on the 300, you will know that King Xerxes was the king of, of uh, uh, Babylon, Persia, Persian area, and he was a ruthless and powerful king. In fact, his name, they called him Shah and Shah, which means king of kings. Interesting, right? He claimed for himself the title of king of kings. So powerful. Now, he was celebrating his greatness and his kingdom's greatness, and he and a bunch of the men that were important in his kingdom got together and they drank for a long, long time. And they didn't run out. And there was plenty of wine to be had. And then Queen Zer or King Xerxes had a brilliant idea brilliant idea. I'm going to bring out my wife, Queen Vashti, and show everyone how beautiful she is. So he sent for her in his drunken revelry, and she said, mm -mm. I'm not going to parade myself in front of all those drunken animals, those men. And he said, yes, you are. She said, no, I'm not. And it became a big crisis because, as the men at the party said, if, it's, if it becomes known that Queen Vashti rebelled against you, king, all the women in our kingdom will rebel against all of their husbands. We can't have that, can we? I mean, in this drunken stupor, this all made a lot of sense to them, I'm sure. So, King Xerxes disposes Queen Vashti, and in another brilliant stroke of genius, he says, send out couriers, send out people throughout my kingdom, and get the hottest looking women in the kingdom who aren't married, and bring them here to me, and I'll check them out, because I need a new queen. And so they would come in, and after preparation with cosmetics and getting them in shape and making sure they were eating right, and they had the most beautiful clothes that were available at that time, they would go in and spend the night with the king. And there was one woman, her name was Esther. She was a Jew, but she kept that hidden. Her parents had died, and she was raised by a relative named Mordecai. Mordecai said, look, you got to do what the king says. If he calls upon you, you got to go in, but don't tell anybody that you're Jewish. So she went in, and the king fell madly in love with her. And he said, this is my new queen, Queen Esther. So she was made queen. Meanwhile, there's this man named Haman. Haman was not a very good guy, but he kind of rose up through the ranks of King Xerxes' court, and he got in good with King Xerxes, and Xerxes made him like second in command in the kingdom. And he issued a decree, he said, every time Haman goes by, everyone needs to kneel and bow just as if it was the king. So Haman's strutting around, and he's feeling pretty powerful, and he struts around, and everyone kneels and bows except for Mordecai, Mordecai the Jew. 
Mordecai wouldn't kneel and he wouldn't bow before Haman because he saw something in Haman that was evil and Haman's people were like perpetual enemies of the Jews and tried to hurt them and destroy them. So he wouldn't bow down before Haman. And Haman, Haman had so much, but this one guy in the kingdom who wouldn't bow down got on his last nerve. And he said, I got to do something about this guy, Mordecai. So he says, you know what? It's not enough just to destroy Mordecai. I'm going to destroy all the Jews. So he goes into the king and he says this, um, great king, king of kings, there's this people in your empire and they're different. They don't worship idols like we do and quite frankly, they keep to themselves and they're money grubbers and this and that and, and we need to destroy them. And the king says, okay. This king is brilliant, by the way, isn't he? He's brilliant. So he takes his signet ring and he seals it and, and uh, Haman sends out the order throughout the empire that on this date and they they cast lots to try to figure out what day would be best to kill all the Jews. And the dice were called pure, P-U-R. That's going to become important in a minute. And they decided that on such and such date, all the Jews in the kingdom would be destroyed. Well, Mordecai found out about this. And he, of course, like all the other Jews, were distressed and so he put on sackcloth and ashes, and he went and he sat at the gate to the king's palace. And Esther heard about this, and she didn't know what was going on. She heard that Mordecai was there with sackcloth and ashes, so she did what, what, what many women would do. She sent him a new pair of clothes, thinking he needed to spruce up a little bit. She had no idea what he was doing. And he sent back a message and he said, I cannot put on clothes. I cannot eat because Haman has sent out a message to destroy all of the Jews. And in fact, Esther, you need to go in and tell the king you need to tell the king what's going on, and you need to stop this. And she said, nobody is allowed to go see the king unless he summons them, because if anyone goes in to see the king without being called, they will be put to death, unless he extends the royal scepter. And it's a risk. And she said, I have not been called in there for 30 days. I don't know the next time that he's going to call for me. And this is what, I'm not going to go ahead and read the whole passage. This is what Mordecai sent back to Esther. He said, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will per perish. And who know it, knows, and this is the key, key verse, who knows, but you have come to royal position for such a time as this. And Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king. And even though it is against the law, if I perish, I perish. So she goes in and she sees the king and fortunately, he extends to her the royal scepter, and he says, what is it, dear, that you want? She says, I want you to come have dinner with me, and I want you to invite Haman to dinner. The king says, great. So they come, they have dinner, and the uh, king says, okay, what is it that you want? She says, well, what I really want is for you to come back to dinner one more time. I think she lost her nerve at this point. I don't know. Meanwhile, Haman is getting more and more upset with Mordecai. 
And he decides on advice from his wife and his family, his relatives, he decides that he's going to build a gallows and hang Haman. He's going to go in and he's going to hang Mordecai, excuse me. He's going to tell the king that this man Mordecai is not bowing before him and he needs to be put to death. Meanwhile, before the second dinner, is this interesting to you? Yeah, yeah. Before the second dinner, it's nighttime, and the king cannot sleep. And so, being the king of kings, he asks one of his scribes to come in and read to him the record of his reign. He wanted to hear about himself. Let's read about my favorite subject, he said, me. And so, the scribe comes in and he reads and he gets to this part of the story where a man named hey, uh, Mordecai, it's hard to keep all these names straight, where a man named Mordecai hears a conspiracy in the hallway of two men who are trying to assassinate the king. And Mordecai tells Esther, who tells the king, that Mordecai heard these two men talking. So they do some investigation, and they find out that these two men are plotting to kill and assassinate, to assassinate the king. And when the king hears this again, he says, what was ever done for Mordecai? What was done? And the scribe says, well, nothing. And he says, I got to do something. It's early in the morning now, but I think I hear Haman out in the garden area and, and send him in. Send Haman in. I need to talk with him. And he says to Haman, and Haman's there, by the way, to say to the king, we need to hang Mordecai. This is getting good, right? So Haman comes in, and the king says, Haman, what should I do if I really want to honor somebody? And Haman thinks it's him. So he says, <laughs> get a royal robe, put it on the man, have him ride on your royal steed, and have someone lead this man on the horse throughout the town, throughout the city, saying, this is the favor that is shown to those who the king is pleased with. And the king says, that's a brilliant plan. Go and do this for Mordecai, and you lead the horse. <laughs> so Haman is furious. And so you can imagine him, this is what's done for the man whom the king has favor in. So, so they go to the second dinner. Haman's furious. And finally, after dinner, the king says to Esther, so what is it that you want? She said, please save my people and save my life. And the king's like, what are you talking about? She said, there's an order to kill all the Jews, and I'm a Jew. And the king says, who, whose idea was this? And Esther says, Haman's. And Haman's sitting there, and he's like, mm, gulp. And the king is furious. And so he leaves the room. And while he leaves the room... <laughs> Haman comes to Queen Esther and he begs her, please, please spare my life, please. And he like trips and falls or something on her. And so the king comes in and so Haman's on top of his wife. <laughs> and he says, the king says, in my own palace, you're violating my wife. And just then one of the eunuchs walks in, I, this is perfect timing, and says, oh, great king, there is a gallows outside that Haman had built for Mordecai, the man you were honoring today. And the king says, put Haman up there. And they hang Haman. And Mordecai becomes second in command over the kingdom. But they can't, re they can't like, uh, take back the order. So the Jews are still going to be killed on a certain day. So the king issues another order, and he says, I will equip 
and I will promote and I will support the Jews defending themselves. And so the Jews protected themselves and they were saved. Jews still celebrate this today. It's called the Feast of Purim. Purim. This year was the last day of February and the first day of March. It is still celebrated. Now, you may be asking yourself, what does this have to do with Mother's Day? It has a lot to do with Mother's Day. There are f- several families who are key elements to this story. First of all, there's the broken family of the king and his queen. This is a time and place where people were objects. Women were objects. Jews were objects. Men who worked around the king were eunuchs. People were disposable. People were not valued as they are today. And in the midst of such a culture, there is a woman named Esther who shines, who rises above, who does God's work, who saves people's lives, who changes history. You have the family of the king, dysfunctional. You have Haman and his family, filled with hatred. You have Esther and her relative Mordecai. Her parents are dead. This isn't what she planned in life. This isn't what she wanted. But she and her father figure worship the Lord and follow the God that we follow today. And these families are mingling with each other. There's conspiracy and there are battles. Family is very, very important. And mothers, you know it and I know it. We all know you are the key to the family. You are the key. Happy wife, happy life. Thank you, guys. Yeah. If mama ain't happy, now see, we all know these things. We've been, uh, we've been taught well by our mothers and by others. Yeah. Mothers are the key. Women are the key in our families. So you have these families working with and against one another. We see the importance of family. We also see the importance of a woman who follows the Lord and the difference that she can make. Now, I want to say this. Esther was no Daniel. He said, what does that mean? If you go back and read the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, we see that Daniel was one of these guys who was so holy. He didn't eat the king's food. He didn't wear any of the king's clothing. Didn't worship the king's idols. Barely interacted with the king except what he needed to do for his job. He was wholly set apart from what was evil and set apart for God. And then we have Esther, who not only ate the king's food, but she prepared meals for the king. She was married to the king. God is never mentioned in this book of the Bible. It's the only book where God is not mentioned at all. Esther was a woman of the world. Esther moved about in society, and many people, especially a Daniel, would consider her faith weak, compromising, maybe even sinful. And yet God used her mightily. God rewarded her faith. It turns out she had enough faith and enough acceptance of God's will that she was willing to walk into the throne room and risk death for her people and for her God. So Esther was no Daniel. And she lived during a time when people dehumanized other people. And yet she excelled and changed the world. And my lesson or my message to mothers today, and guys as well, to mothers is this. Following God is a very personal thing. 
What it looks like for you, nobody else has a right to tell you what that means. But as Augustine said, or Augustine said, we are to love God with all of our hearts. Listen closely. Love God with all of our hearts and then do whatever you want. Because if you're in love with God, you'll do what he wants. Everybody's faith looks different. Everybody's family is different. Your walk with the Lord is different than someone else's. I'm not, I'm not excusing sin. I mean, I wish I didn't sin. I wish people around me didn't sin. You know, I just... It's just not something that I'm proud of, that I want to do, although I, I, I do it. Maybe I do want to do it. Anyhow, I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about having that personal relationship with God, and He knows you, and He created you, and He has a purpose for you for such a time as this. This is our time, folks. This is our generation. This is our story. The Jews still celebrate on the day that the Jews were supposed to be destroyed. They celebrate what Esther did, what God did in their lives. And I want you to know this, that as you are following God, as you are following His love and His plan for your life, He will remember your story, and your story will be preserved in the mind of God. And your families will sing and talk about how wonderful you, you are and how wonderful you were. And they will say something like, he was a very religious person. She was a very spiritual Christian. And you will go down in history as a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, a husband, a wife, a mother, a father, a child, a friend, a fellow church member. It's a man or woman after God's own heart, and you changed your generation. And that's, that's been our prayer for my oldest daughter, all four of my daughters. But for my daughter, Esther, we deliberately named her that, feeling that that's what God wanted us to name her, because we wanted her to speak to her generation and make a difference. And my prayer for all of us is that we will walk in the plan that God has for us and we will accept the lavish love that God has for us. His graciousness, we will walk close to Him, with Him, and for Him. Amen. Let's bow our heads. <coughs> Father, we thank you for a room full of Queen Esthers. We thank you for a war room full of women and men who have served you. And life hasn't always been what it was supposed to be, and sometimes we wonder why it takes the turns it does. But, <laughs> Father, through it all, we see your hand in our mother's lives and in our own. This morning, Lord, if there's anyone who would like to accept Christ, please move upon their heart. Now is the time to worship. Bless us, Lord, as we go forth. Bless our mothers in Christ's name. Amen.